Hello, anyone who's listening. I'm Richard Fish, the writer, director, cinematographer, editor of this film. Um, obviously, what we're watching now is the two actors holding a DVD copy of my other film, my first film, What You Can't Promise, because I'm just that cheesy. Um, this was, I think, also the first thing that I filmed. Actually, for a while, I didn't have a lead actress, and so I was trying to film scenes that did not need Amber, because Amber was the last character that I cast, and she's in nearly every scene, so that was a difficult thing to do. This is Charleston Harvey, who is studying... Um, she's doing an acting course in Los Angeles. So I, of course, entered a film festival, not a big one, but a small one in Los Angeles to try and give her an opportunity to watch the film. Uh, but just like every film festival entry I've had so far, um, it got rejected. So if you're listening to this commentary, you are somebody who thinks this is a good film. So I appreciate that because it seems like pretty much nobody does. I got a review from a website called Screen Critics, and you have to pay them, and they said, oh, yeah, we'll get back to you. You're not buying a good review. But the guy who reviewed it, Carl Burgess, um, really delighted in laying into how bad he thought this film was. He uh, had such classics as... Making a movie can be hard with da -da 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 X requirements. Unfortunately, Richard Fish has failed in every way. I can't remember the exact quotes, but it's quite fun to read if you're uh, in the mood. Um, he also missed his own deadline, so I paid for the Express review, and then three days later it finally appeared, having paid for the 48 hours. So as well as being a particularly harsh critic, he's also terrible at timekeeping. Um, this music that you're listening to now is not part of the original score by Armand. Um, this is me playing on a keyboard and recording with my phone. It was an attempt to kind of copy the John Carpenter basic, not particularly melodic, like dum 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 dum, you know, just kind of give a feel of some danger. Now the choice to use a different font to the poster is deliberate. I don't have a good reason for that. I could have used the same font, but I didn't. I just thought that that font jarred a little bit and I liked that. This is of course me singing. I wrote all of the songs in this uh, except for the National Anthem of the United States because that is already out of copyright, so I could use the real thing. Um, and the Seagull song that Kylo makes up that I do credit as a song, even though it's not really. That little insert shot of the Niagara Falls State Park was because when I did the screening in Doncaster, people weren't able to make the link that the river that we're about to see is actually at the top of Niagara Falls. And I think that was a very, uh, sorry, a very valid point that people don't necessarily know where this is. And one of the things in that scathing review was you know, the body gets chucked into a lake somewhere and it doesn't make a lot of sense. And so while that is the top of Niagara Falls, it's not clearly the top of Niagara Falls if you don't know the area. Obviously, the first screening of this film was in Niagara Falls where the film was made. So nobody had that complaint. The girl on the bench there is Caitlin Cadet, who was also the AD on everything that we've watched thus far. She 
helped me massively to film the uh, opening little bit there. At one point, that opening scene between Steve and Rachel was intended to be the sort of trailer. I thought I could do my kind of version of that scream intro with a phone call, but obviously this is nowhere near as good. But um, that was going to be kind of an extra scene that led into the movie because I don't like movie trailers and I find them incredibly hard to cut. This film doesn't really have a trailer. It has a kind of teaser that's online somewhere, but I don't have a genuine story trailer for this film. I... just have a kind of tonal montage. Um, here, of course, we are looking at Alexandria Romanov. Um, that is a stage name, like quite a few of the actors in this, actually. Maybe people just don't want to be associated with me. Um, but that is her professional name um, for all acting. And she is great. Actually, Mark Bogomil, who plays Steve, recommended her to me because I was struggling to find somebody who was quite the way that I had imagined Amber to be. Um, this phone call... I'm going off on tangents because I'm telling stories and then getting distracted by things on screen. I suppose that's normal. This phone call was a real phone call. Um, Stacy, who plays Gloria, was outside in her car and this is the first of a few scenes where we see this DJI microphone on Amber's lapel because I thought if I make her be someone who makes videos to go on the internet then I can just have her wear a mic in shot and it won't be a problem at all. But all of her audio is coming from what we see being recorded on that mic. Uh, it's also the same microphone that I'm using to record this commentary. But yeah, that was a real phone call. And... Yeah. <laughs> there are certain things every time I watch this where I think maybe I could have been a bit more succinct on the dialogue and less kind of beating around the bush. But nobody's complained about it yet. I just think it's because I've seen this film a lot. Although this is the first time that I'm watching this very version of it. Um, by that I mean this is the Film Freeway version that, if anybody doesn't know, Film Freeway is the website where you enter for festivals. And I've just updated the file because I've moved the order of one scene and I added that little Welcome to Niagara Falls State Park section as well. Um, which I actually went out today and filmed another version because I thought maybe there's a better sign that I could use in that moment. But anyway, if you saw the one that has writing on it, I left it as it is. If you saw the one that has a map on it, I've changed what I did. It's all a very minor detail. This music is Armand's music. And when he sent it to me, which was right before the deadline for the first screening, um, he said, oh, this is just a demo version. But then later when he sent me the updated version, I didn't see the email until after I edited the final film and I didn't go back and change it because it is, well, it's good enough. And by that time, I kind of accepted it. This on the beach thing, originally, yes, there was supposed to be a police officer. And I know, yes, that would be in a morgue in real life, but I wanted to film at what is the coast that is the coast of where lake ontario meets youngstown and you can look across and see the skyline of toronto and i just wanted to go there that's also where this coffee shop is this is the hill of beans cafe and the owner louis thien let us film there um he is a huge movie fan as you can probably tell everything in the background has posters for the film casablanca which is the whole theme of his restaurant which i'm sure he doesn't have the rights to any more than I do. Um, I am a little bit worried that when this film goes on streaming, I'll have to kind of blur out all the... I'll replace them with something for copyright reasons. But honestly, I think if Warner Brothers are going to try and come after me for Casablanca copyright, then I'm doing something right. You know, because that... I, I, I don't know, and I'm not a lawyer, but that, to me, is incidental. 
It's not, I'm not dwelling on it. You can see that that's Bogart sitting there, but whatever. Same thing when we get to the club later, which is actually the screening room. Uh, it's an independent cinema. There's movie posters everywhere. I asked the, the owner there, um, Bob Galibasuk, if we could cover them or take them down. He said no. I said cool. He was letting me film in there for really cheap. Um, I got lucky with this. I mean, this film actually does have a budget unlike anything else I've ever made. I mean, what you can't promise costs about 500 pounds to make. This... I had $3,000, and between production and post-production, I I spent it all. I, I, I probably could have made this money for even less money than that, just because I'm so used to doing everything for nothing. But that really helped ease things. I was able to replace things when they were broken. I could just buy incidental things as and when for the film. Probably the kind of thing that I wouldn't even account for uh, normally. I budgeted, for example... Blackout blinds. I would have just bought those and forget that I bought them and not count them in the budget, but that's the first thing that comes to my mind. And I know for a fact that after this film, Lewis has let other people film there as well. And there's a possibility I'll be going back with a friend to make a film there. Um, I'll, I'll just be an actor in that one, just be an actor. Um, I will be an actor in that. I'll have a different role, which is no more or less important than what I did here. You can see results of equipment there. Yes, the clock is not consistent. If you care enough to watch the clock, you can see that time jumps. I didn't catch it when we filmed. Nothing I can do about it now. This table that they're sitting at, which looks like a normal table, is a really long bench. So if memory serves, actually the camera was on this bench for a while. Um, but while I've been editing this film, I've kind of imagined it as a normal size table, even though it's not. I'm looking at the clock in the corner. Obviously, it's wrong. There are mistakes in this film. Um, some of them I agonized over fixing, and I'll mention them when they come up, even though I'm probably the only person on Earth who would have noticed them. Who I've not mentioned is Sammy Carroll, who is a writer-director in her own right. She is the barista who in the script and in the credits is called Jana, although it's never mentioned on screen. Something I've noticed since I moved to Western New York is there is a lot of Polish, there's a lot of Italian, and there's quite a bit of German um, surnames and place names and things. Uh, usually a lot of the pronunciation is a bit anglicized, and I kind of mock that a little bit. Like even Amber's name is mentioned at one point. She's called... Amber Bernstein or Amber Bernstein. So her name is Amber Amber, if you understand German. That's just the kind of like fun thing that I kind of notice that I like to kind of have a little bit of fun with. The second review for this movie by Amber Jackson at UK Film Review acknowledged that what I do what I was trying to do is kind of poke fun at everything without being disrespectful to anyone, which is incredibly difficult when you're dealing with all these uh, highly um, polarized politics in the United States. You know, so I, I, I make an effort to poke fun at the right and the left and just kind of heighten the things that to me as an outsider are extreme. And some of these are general American things, like the flagpole scene and the singing. It's a real thing that people sing the 5K, uh, sorry, the national anthem if you go to a 5K. That blew my mind. Because um, it's just so weird and nationalistic. I mean, people here have the flag on their houses, probably a one in four houses has a flagpole with the United States flag outside. Like, that would be insane in many countries, and it, to me, it's kind of so weird. And then, you know, in schools, they do things like the Pledge of Allegiance, where they do this full-on salute to the country, and the, the, the level of nationalism is very, yeah, it's extreme. Like, if you're American listening to this, it's probably the sort of thing that you've just grown up with, and you think it's perfectly normal, but it's, to someone who's from elsewhere, it is, it's a lot.
It's a lot. Like the pledge, for instance, I looked up and I know that, that, so there's three countries in the world that do that. It's the US, North Korea, and Turkey. So, you know, take from that what you will. Forcing kids to say some sort of nationalistic pledge every morning. Um, I don't necessarily like the framing of everything in this scene. Um, when I was editing it, I did have motivation for when it was going to be a tighter shot and when it was going to be a big one but now when i watch it back it just seems to change haphazardly, haphazardly and most of it is cropping rather than zooming i filmed this entirely in 4k but the final master is full hd so i had room to play around with cropping and so on This scene originally did not have music, so if you're watching this for the first time, having seen it at the original premiere, the one in Niagara Falls, the cafe has some great uh, Spearfisher music, which was part of the music package that I bought with the budget. I paid about $500 for music rights to Ben Sound uh, because I needed music for the club, and that's not the sort of thing I could get a composer to do. It had to be big, dense music. And uh, this, this music I just enjoyed. So every time we're in the cafe, it's Spearfisher. We hear three different songs. And I'm going to try and use them again while I still have the license to do that. Maddie was a good sport about this. And we filmed that twice. And the version in the film is the... less graphic of the two and i think the music tones it down a little bit as well sadly so I, I do still struggle with whether or not this scene needs music but it it felt very kind of clinical and dead without it but the uh the deep throat banana is is an important scene <laughs> um this isn't one of those scenes that i filmed early on travis uh did his all of his stuff early on the shoot and he's now moved out to Atlanta to chase his dreams much much like Charleston moved out Travis is also you know he's gone to a center she's gone to LA he's gone to Atlanta where they make a lot of the Netflix shows and things and he's still making his own stuff and presumably going out looking for auditions we've not spoken in a little while uh, but this scene was filmed early on this was behind Amber Um, I like what the two of them do here. Um, just a boring technical thing for anyone who cares. I had to flip the sound channels for this because, I don't know, I guess I'd put the microphone up, upside down or something, but they were, the, the voices were coming from the wrong sides of the screen, so I had to flip that. And it has a weird effect of making a plane that flies overhead sound to be coming from somewhere else. I love this line, but I feel like there's something either in the timing of the delivery or the editing that just kind of lessened the joke there. It did get a laugh, uh, a laugh in Doncaster, but when it played here, it was kind of, here in Niagara Falls, it was kind of flat and didn't hit as hard as I felt it should. But then there's other things in the film that get a much bigger laugh than I expect, so it's it's... it's it's hard to exactly predict what will and won't work with different audiences. Um, but what, I mean, it genuinely surprised to me that this hasn't been picked up by any festivals anywhere. And I'm still just, you know, sitting waiting for rejections. And you pay money for these things. Uh, the reason I'm watching this now is because this is the latest uh, version for Film Freeway. And it's because it's going to be submitted to Amazing Fantasy Fest. Obviously, at this point in time... Um, I don't know whether or not it will be accepted there. I would hope so and somewhat expect so because I pretty much know everyone who runs the festival. So it will be a double kick in the teeth if I don't get into that. Um, I didn't want to pay for it originally. I didn't want to wait for the first, both because it's way more expensive than most of the other festivals and also because I feel like in Buffalo... I already have an audience. Like, this film could play at the screening room or we could do an independent screening anywhere and people would come because people know the actors, they know me, they know that it's a local film and people want to see this. 
Whereas by showing at a film festival, we have to pay a hundred dollars for the chance of it being shown. Um, this is the first of the CGI shots in the film, I believe. That degree certificate on the wall has the character's name, Michael Brooks, uh, which is otherwise unsaid throughout the film, but he's named in the script. I don't really focus too much on whether or not anybody says any character's name unless there's a reason for it. So the two there's a reason for is Amber Bernstein that I've mentioned already, and then later Jill's name is Ciabatta, like the Italian bread, but I have it delivered as Sia Beta just because it's one of those anglicized words that I hear a lot of. Yes, there are definitely focus issues in this scene. No, I did not notice them when I was filming, so I had to find ways to cover them up in the edit, and I did not always succeed. What I didn't do was have it tracking in the middle of shots. It was either at the start or the end, and so I just kind of held onto shots where I could. Uh, there were multiple good attempts at this scene, and this is a little bit of a compilation of my greatest hits. I also cut a minute or so out of this because it was based on the script, but there was also a degree of improvisation from the actors, and for pacing I had to kind of cut it short a little bit. And I, when I did the first screening in Niagara Falls, I did think that this would be in that I cut down more to help the film as a whole kind of flow. Uh, but Alex really didn't want me to cut it because uh, she thinks it's her favorite scene as an actor. She is really good in this. He's great too. Um, he... I'm being careful here. So the actor who plays Brooks, um, I was not able to credit because there's various kind of complications there. But he is fantastic and I would love to shout about how great he is in this film uh, because I think that these scenes, while they are kind of tonally a little bit different from the rest of the film, are the emotional core. And I do, in some ways, set up a red herring here in that we have all these like agonizing scenes of Amber and then later there's a reveal and it's kind of turned on its head. But I think, especially for first-time viewers, these scenes are important so that we as an audience are endeared to Amber. Though, I'll never know, because I wrote the script, I edited the film, I can't possibly know how this film will be experienced to anybody who is a complete outsider, other than watching them. So the first screening at uh, Niagara Falls had some people in the audience who had just seen the poster and rocked up and they were laughing their heads off and I feel like that is the best indicator for me. This is it's a comedy but it's not only a comedy. I mean my initial idea for this film came from trying to get distribution for what you can't promise and not being able to because the message I got a couple of times was the only way you can be successful with no money is to make a horror film because that has an audience at all levels. So I started to write a horror film, but I knew that I didn't just want to make a straight horror film, because my favorite horror films are already a little bit subvert in the genre, like I love the Scream films, and there are some classic horror films I like, but those are kind of my basis, so this became kind of Scream, with some music, with some culture shock, and so it's sort of Scream meets Pitch Perfect meets that kind of almost South Park type humor or Team America, which is a film I've not seen since it was new, but it's that kind of poking fun at America. Um, but again, I have to be careful because as I am an outsider, I don't want it to seem as me being offensive or making fun of Americans. I just think it's not that at all. What it is, is just me 
as somebody who has moved here, I am able to see the things that the people who grow up in this place take to be normal and commonplace and recognize actually no no this is this is unique this is a thing about this place and some of it i can dial up and it goes completely under the radar i'm sure you know americans watching this film don't pick up on there being anything unusual about the national anthem for instance um but there are other moments too they're just not immediately in my mind this office uh was a real canvas. Uh, the, the man who let me film it is a friend, and this is his job, this is his office. Um, that's Rich Tippett, who is in the film later. He is one of the mourners in the funeral scene, as are quite a few of the people uh, I know who work creatively in film, and those people all agreed to do it just as a favor, and, you know, I guess to have a cool little cameo. Um, I'll try and point out everyone uh, when we get to the scene. Though they are they are only on screen for a couple of seconds. There's a, there's a longer version of most of them, but it would have just been showing them to, for the sake of showing them. There's no narrative feature, uh, reason to hold those scenes any longer than they are. Um, if for whatever reason you are watching this with the subtitles, you'll notice that all of the spellings are the American spellings, which uh, I, I kind of see as a little bit of a challenge, remembering to do it and finding them. And the script I also wrote, deliberately trying to disguise that I'm a British writer, I wrote all with American spellings, American terms of phrase and so on. Um, when we first read it, Brandon, who doesn't appear in this film for a while, but when he does, he steals every scene that he's in. Um, Brandon, who plays Egan, mocked me for saying toilet cubicle, whereas, of course, here in the US, it is a toilet stall, and if you say cubicle, you'll get strange looks. Maybe that's an old-fashioned term anyway. At this point, I can't always remember what's America, what's the UK, and what's just me. Uh, this scene was also a lot longer initially. Um, I have not made the special features for the Blu-ray DVD, but if there are extended scenes, this will be one of them. Um, there's not a ton of stuff missing from it. It is just a kind of other version. There, because there was this, there was a thing like, oh, I, I know how I do for you, and she said, do you? And then there was a little bit more of a conversation, and it, it, it kind of felt a little circular. And I boiled this down to what is the point? Okay, they had a falling out. We don't necessarily need to know exactly the details, but we can kind of give the headline information of what happened between these two, why they're frustrated with each other. And also, I need to kind of build up in the background Amber's, uh, Amber's kind of feelings of, you know, rejection and frustration with the world so that, I, so that I'm not just completely cheating at the end of the film. Uh, this is all dubbed. It isn't dubbed particularly well. We filmed all of the lines in my car after we'd been to this shopping center to film because there was music playing and I had no control over cutting the music, which meant that everything we filmed in here had sounds that we could not use, which is why we're seeing the back of the heads. It's also why these people stop and talk rather than continuing to walk and talk. Um, that is, it's a mistake. I mean, she's, she's pointing, she's staring, but she probably, like the two of them probably shouldn't be talking for quite as long as this. But all of this kind of, um, Jill is a bitch talk. She has a lot of my favorite lines in the film because I just wanted this kind of horrible character. And, you know, Maddie, 
who plays her um, sent me an audition tape, which was perfect, and she's told the story as well. She really, she when I when she knew that I didn't have an Amber yet, she kind of was saying like, "Can I get myself bumped? Can I be Amber?" Cause, and it's not so much that I don't think she'd have been good. It's just she's so good as Jill that I, uh, you know, I I could I could see myself writing something for Maddie to star in as a different character, but she is so perfect as Jill that I I just. I couldn't, no, there was no way I was going to move her. She was, she was perfect for it. And so I had to keep looking for Amber. Amelia, who's just been stabbed. Is also perfect. Now, there's a huge continuity error here, of course, and nobody's pointing it out to me. It's like, I wouldn't have asked to do it, but why are her pants not down? She's just been on the toilet. She was mid-shit when somebody walked in, or peeing at the very least. And yet, there she is, fully clothed. It's a mistake. Nobody's mentioned it yet. I've just announced it to the world. It's definitely an error. Sorry. I guess I could crop in to try and cover it up, but it didn't occur to me in the editing. It didn't occur to me until the very last time I watched this, and I was just like, oh, that's a mistake. She ought to be, be you know. Maybe she has so much dignity that as she was dying, she pulled up her pants. I, I Who knows? That radio message, um, I am a, you know, all of these, I am this, 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 this. This comes from my fatigue with listening to the radio here. Now, I'm all for, you know, it being inclusive and, you know, writing some of the historical wrongs. But if I turn the radio on here, it's like the only thing they ever talk about is like, oh, th th because I've got to address this, because this is inequality embedded in society. And it, like, it doesn't matter what they're talking about. Like, they always bring it back to how this is unfair for this group. This is unfair for this group. We've got to do this, 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 this. And it's just, there comes a point where it's like, okay, fine. Could you please talk about something else now? Um, you know, with all the respect in the world, that it's... Yes, it's important, but it's not the only thing in the world. And that's how to get yourself cancelled with Richard Fish. There's a little problem with the camera. One of the, I filmed this with two cameras, and one of them, when you zoom in a certain amount, it has a little, what looks like a head within it, and it was just there on Maddie's face. There's a couple of times that I covered it up where I could. For example, that scene by the lake, I, uh, you know, I talked about CGI shots. I did kind of uh, mask out part of the sky with another part of the sky in order to cover up that problem with the lens. Um, Sean here playing Derek. Um, it, it, it's I think he's struggling a little bit to go so far against himself. He's the kind of really sweet natured guy who wouldn't say any of these aggressive things in real life, but it's it's funny to watch him do it. I'm sure if you don't know him, you don't have that kind of reservation. Like he totally nails it, but it's funny to watch as somebody who does know this person. Um. Again, I'm jumping around all over the place with the sh shot sizes. I, uh, I could edit this thing forever. You know, there'll always be like one more thing that I want to change or amend. Um, it's true though, you do make a film three times and because I am most of the time the only crew member 
Like genuinely, most of this film is me, some microphones, a couple of cam cameras and tripods and you know lights where they're needed, and I set everything up, and then I start the actors off, and I just keep going till I've got what I can. This is my amazing musical piece again. Uh, that line of Kyla's, uh, who plays Talia, was dubbed. Um, I got them to record it a couple of times. Um, once on set, and I got them to send me a voice message later when I thought I'd lost it, and then I found the original one, and... Yeah, this thing with being the, not always, but most of the film, I was the crew. This is just me. Um, the two of them are mic'd up, again, using the same mics that I'm using right now. So this is largely clean dialogue. And... You know, I think I filmed part of this on my phone. Yeah, I did, because it was 30 frames per second, and it's just, it's easier to get that smooth, smooth, smooth movement. This is terrible, this is wobbly, I just, I kept this because I like the so many seagulls so much. And I'm testing the theory that as long as your audio is good, you can get away with what you want on the picture. Like, the audio here is fine. That picture is kind of stabilized and wobbly, and it's like, what the hell am I doing? Um... Here, Alex is not actually resting on anything. This was to give the impression that the barrier is there, but, you know, because I had to stand there and film it, and I can't fly, um, I had to move the two of them back a little bit. Now, this radio, okay, it was the last thing. This is Audrey Ney, who is an actress who lives in Chicago who I just got talking to on a plane once and we're like Facebook friends and so I needed an American voice to do a radio bit and I just I just asked her, I was like, hey, can you record this line? And she was great, she ran with it. She did like five or six different versions. I might, uh, if, I rem <laughs> if I remember, I will share those. And then there's another one later with uh, Aaron doing the kind of gun-toting, like, guy complaining on the radio. The long version of that is hysterical. So I, I might do some extended radio stuff on the on the Blu-ray or the, the DVD or somewhere. Um, a kumquat. That is the one exception I gave to using British spellings. I was... N never been so disappointed when I learned that Americans spell kumquat with a K because it ruins my joke. But I just thought, you know what? I'm going to have that one. It's not like it's a word that people use all the time anyway, so it's kumquat. Um, oh, these two hated the word ineffable and they just... They didn't want to do this line the way I'd written it. Uh, it's close enough. I I kind of let that one go. Like there was a, a very clear way that I wanted that line to be, but I guess communication or because I, I, I couldn't kind of get the two of them to hear the line in their minds the way that I needed it to go, it didn't quite work. Although I will say... In Doncaster, that got a laugh, so it, so it does work. The door behind uh, Talia and Amber there is reflecting all the lights. You can see the camera, there you are, there's a camera, there's a camera, and once Talia moves out of the way, you could see very clearly my silhouette, which is uh, why there is a crop coming up. There we go. You can still see the camera, but you can also see my entire shape. But you know what? It helps the film. It should come closer to the two of them when it's the two of them. Mark insisted there. So Mark, who plays Steve, insisted that we do this scene 
four or five times because he thought it was an important scene for him to use for his showreel. And I did I did watch them all back, but my favourite was still the first, even though it has this awkward framing where he kind of goes out a little bit. I, I like that tight shot. It does kind of make the moment feel uncomfortable, you know? Like, I'm trying to, like, retrofit some kind of artistic merit to something that's just poorly framed. But I like it because it makes us as an audience feel uncomfortable in the way that this situation is also uncomfortable. Like, I'd like to say, oh, yes, I was intended to do that all along. I'm not. It was more a kind of, as I was watching it, realizing that it works in spite of itself and just keeping it. The music levels in this scene bounces up and down a little bit more noticeably than I'd like, but it is to accommodate the dialogue. And that's because I am not a sound engineer, I'm not an expert, I don't really know how to do these things. This annoys the hell out of me, like this really happens. Like the, the, the tipping culture, like I, you know, I'm an outsider, so yeah, the, can I keep this? Do you need change? That happens all the time. And this is already a very expensive place. At least from my perspective, compared to, you know, anywhere else I've ever lived, this is an expensive place to be, especially when it comes to food and drink, either restaurants and bars or even at the supermarket. It is just, it's really expensive. Love her timing on that. I mean, there's there's all kinds of like reflections and shadows of bits of equipment in the film. That bathroom that everyone's walking out of is actually what we were using as the green room. It's a little cafe next door that, you know, you put a bathroom sign on, you work wonders. And the light shining through isn't a fluorescent light coming from the bathroom, that is daylight. There's a few moments in this film where I hold on Egan a really long time. Like, like th there's a kind of moment where you would naturally want to cut in the way, you know, in Walter Murch's book. I mean, the title of the book is In the Blink of an Eye. So the idea is when you would want to blink, you would cut. And I definitely hold him too long to make us uncomfortable. And I love it. Um, I just mentioned Cassandra in the back there as the uh, bartender. She is also um, an actress who I've seen in quite a few things, and you know, would know each other a little bit. We would we were gonna do an improv class, gonna host an improv class, and that just hasn't yet happened. Uh, but no, she's cool, and I just kind of when I had these little bit parts, a lot of them rather than try and audition people and cast and be like, hey, can you come and do this thing for me for one day? I just kind of deliberate, I, sorry, directly contacted people that I knew that I might like do it and most of them did. This song feels completely different to how I had imagined it. So the way that this works is I came up with the lyrics and I sang them pretty much this exact melody, and then I sent them to Amand, and I, in my mind I was expecting some sort of kind of Sinatra style swing feeling, and he came back and said, well the way you're singing it doesn't fit that, this is a country song. Um, and now, you know, now I'm hearing it as a country song and looking at Egan, and you know, this, it's, this is an American film, I mean, both of those are American things, but that's kind of more of a to me, country music is, it's like, it's rural, it's kind of maybe a little bit less cosmopolitan kind of style of music. And so it's perfect for Egan. Um, that little face there, be careful what you, what you do uh, when people are walking around with cameras, Mark, because that was just him kind of goofing around. And as soon as I saw it, I was like, that's going in there. Yes, I'm overindulgent with the loud music and the dance scene that goes on 
forever, but much like me now, we've been watching something like 40 minutes of talk, 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 room, talk, talk, room, and I just wanted to let it breathe a little bit. Um, this is the screening room, as I mentioned earlier. This is my favorite place in all of Buffalo. They show old films there. They host all kinds of events there. It is just a wonderful place to go as a filmmaker. Um, you can see from the posters, things like you know, Man Who Knew Too Much, Hitchcock. You've got um, Hunt for Red October, uh, Metropolis. Uh, the unbearable likeness of being like he he does a broad range of things and pretty much anything goes it's a, it's a it's a great place to be it's kind of a film fan for film fan so i feel like because of that he was very much on board with me going in there and filming and I was in there the whole day and turned it into a club. Sort of works. Also, Brandon provided all of the DJ stuff. Like, this looks like a club because I Brandon came in and did all the lights, did all the music, did all the speaking. I mean, these people are dancing to real music that obviously I can't use because um, I don't have millions of dollars to pay for rights. Um, Tim, who you can see there, is kind of accidentally an extra. He was filming a BTS documentary, which will be on the Blu-ray for this film. And I, I like exclusive features, so a lot of these special features are going to be only on the Blu-ray, and I won't release them anywhere else, or the Blu-ray or the DVD, but for, yeah. Uh, when that camera spun around just there, you do see me. You see me, and you see the killer in costume. So if you care, if you want to rewind that and pause for a brief moment, you see the killer, and you see me. The banana eating bouncer is in the background a lot. I don't know how many bananas he gets through or how many bananas are in this film, but it is a lot. Uh, there is a scene that I don't think I'm even going to look for. There, there was a moment where Josh, who we see there in the kind of Hawaiian shirt, gets kicked out by the bouncer for being a little bit unruly. Um, but no, we just kind of see him at the bar. He's, he's kind of my norm. Um. Now I did cut that moment for a while where Derek kind of looks after Talia leaves and like stares for a little bit and is a little bit sleazy because I thought, oh, if I have that moment, then we're not going to care so much when Derek dies. But then the last time I watched this uh, in Doncaster with an audience, I... I kind of thought, you know what, that moment is completely in keeping with what we've seen of his character so far, and it doesn't mean that we like him less or we care less because he's this kind of like bro, or, you know, he's just kind of like, yeah, let's go and get some ladies. I love this. I wish I had a meteor sound effect, but I have what I have. If you're paying attention to this scene, you can totally tell who the killer is. Um, the hair comes out and is jumping around, but it, I, don't, I don't know how much it matters. The selfie over the body was one of my key ideas behind this. Like, overuse of phones. So, initially, right at the start, when we have the girl on the bench um, not noticing the killing because she's on her phone, and then again, we've got the killer who's just taking selfies of the body. Like, that was the whole... The whole reason we are in this club is to get that selfie over the body in a crowded room. You can see all kinds of bits of... There's a tripod and some other equipment in the background. It, it's inevitable. I mean... I guess this is a B-movie and I hadn't really realized that it's a B-movie, but I hope that it's a somewhat intelligent B-movie parody. It was, a lot of the time, it was chipping away at stone. Uh, with this. All right, I've got to say, Sam Colliano filmed part of the club scene. I kept meaning to say that, and now we're out of the club scene. Um, he's great. A lot of the stuff that we used was his footage and not mine, so I can't claim that I filmed all of that. 
And here we are with the greatest uh, lovemaking scene. Um, I was going to say of all time. <laughs> no, I, I really like what I've done here. It, it was described in the script as a mix between the kind of pop imagery of the Velocipastor sex scene. If you haven't seen that, go and watch the sex scene from Velocipastor on YouTube. It is wonderful. The film is shite. They're living off a, uh, a title, but the, the sex scene is its something else. It's worth the film, worth the film existing alone. And I also wanted a little bit, and so in my script I describe this as kind of a mix between that kind of pop art brilliance of Velocipastor with the um, earnest lovemaking of Meet Joe Black, which um, both of those are movie sex scenes that have no nudity. And I'm not against nudity, I just don't want to put it in there for the sake of it being there. If there'd been a reason, I'd have used it. But I can get my point across and have all my fun without having to have nudity. Um, I actually had an intimacy coordinator, Sean, who was quite keen to go, you know, you can push this further if you want. You can you can get some more flesh. Um, maybe not quite like that, Sean, if you're listening, but it, it did feel... Like I was kind of going, no, 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 we can have this kind of nice little conservative lovemaking scene as I watch Bananas. Um... <sighs> Harold. Absolutely amazing. He still hasn't seen this yet. Um, the Dancing Banana is... There should be an Oscar for that. There's the Petit Mo. Um Talia over the, the dead body with the orgasm. Yeah, and then the coffee. You know, that's that's... Is it too late to still kind of see the parallels between the coffee boiling over and something else? I don't know. And this is Lloyd Lasrop's house, who is another filmmaker um, who let me film at his house. Because I needed Amber to have a really nice house because she's got a lot of money that we don't know where it comes from. You'll notice that this scene is also out of focus. That's because the one take I had that was in focus was a fluffed take. So I had to choose between good performance, everything where it needs to be, and slightly enough. So you see the corner of that table is in perfect focus. And that is because I cocked it up. Hopefully it doesn't ruin your enjoyment too much. Now the sound on this doorstep has this kind of awkward silence where we just hear their voices and that is deliberate. I had Lots of options here. I had two kind of stereo microphones recording everything, all of the ambient noise, all of the conversation, and I could have just used those, but instead I used these labs. There's obviously the one that you can see that she's wearing, the voice recorder, and then Brandon has a kind of more traditional lav underneath his t-shirt. And so I, I had the dialogue covered, and I did try kind of mixing the ambient sound, uh, or just using the, the, the kind of wild track that recorded everything. Then I had using the labs with a little bit of replacement sound for the outdoor noise. And But what I found is just using the labs made this entire conversation so much more awkward in a in a perfect way. So this is, this is the whole thing I was saying about. It. So I, I wrote the movie and then the actors kind of rewrote the movie in a way by putting their own spin on certain things at times um kind of unexpected but i liked what they were doing so i just went with it and then other times it's just kind of because the way i'd written it felt a little bit unnatural coming out of the actor that i had in front of me so we kind of found a compromise it's, it's all you're always remolding the shape of the piece um 
But the edit, sometimes I had to just cope with what I had because I maybe hadn't recorded the perfect version like the out of focus scene we just saw, but this I had a lot of choice. And so it was fun to kind of mold my favorite bits, kind of like a greatest hits album. Um, where I have long takes of certain scenes, I have used them because the editing software I was initially using added pops, which limited my ability to cut in and out. Um, that particularly affects the therapist scene, the first one, and the initial scene between Talia and Amber in the house because I edited the film in order because I didn't edit a thing until I had filmed everything. Um, uh, actually, you know, question is that entirely true? I think so. I think that's true. I think I'd fit. I, I went back and filmed things where there were obvious holes, but it was all filming by myself. I couldn't get you know, the actors together and the locations together and <laughs> Oh it's wonderful. There's another cock up, those are my shoes keeping that door open. Uh, why were we keeping the door open? I have no idea. I can't remember. That was the last summer now. Maybe Amber just keeps some men's shoes lying around. I mean, it could. maybe it's another victim that we just don't know about. Heck, maybe they belong to her dad or something. We don't know what's happened to this girl's parents. Maybe that's why she's messed up. Brandon also has still not seen this film. Um, because I've been very protective to not let anybody see this film. Except in public screenings. I was offered $50 for a copy of this film and I turned it down. Even though I'm dirt poor. I just don't want to share it around. Okay, here's another CGI shot. If you look to the top left, you will see a poster from Bytractive. That is the only poster in that room that is not on the walls anyway. All of the artwork is credited, uh, including the piece that I covered up. Um, I don't know who did which piece. I just made sure I had all the artists' names and clearance for that. So, sorry if that's your picture I covered. Put my little Easter egg in there. Um... There's a joke at the end of this scene that ends really flat because it's basically just for me. Um, since I moved to Western New York, I've noticed that people will say, have a night, no matter what time of day it is. Some people have acknowledged this and said, oh yeah, it's normal because it means, you know, you're going to have a great night when it, when it comes. And other people just deny that it happens, but it definitely happens. Like, if you live in the area, listen for it. You could... Go and buy a coffee at 8 a.m. And then the person will say to you, okay, have a great night. Um, and I just found that bizarre. So I wanted to put in, have a great night. Um, in this scene. I don't know why the person's Kermit. This is such an implausibly long morning. This is all the same day. So after the club, we've had all this stuff happening. The yoga, Egan, the, you know, the therapist. Then we're going to go on and see um, Jill leaving Steve's and Jill and Talia by the water. Then we're going to be in Steve's house and it's all the same morning. And, you know, how late is Steve sleeping? Who knows? I actually moved in all versions until this final version. I had the scene by the water where Talia and Jill are discussing whether or not Steve could be the killer after we already know that Steve's dead. And I know that this is a crazy thing to do and it makes no sense, but I kind of justified it to myself thinking, 
well, you know, they don't know, and they could still be talking about it. But then there is no reason for that scene to exist. For the audience, for them, sure. But for the audience, it doesn't really need to be there. And I had originally considered cutting the scene entirely. And I wanted the scene because I like what the actors did. Uh, that tea towel is obviously in place just to cover up the oven clock. Um, I could make another documentary about oven clocks in this film. Uh, I'll tell you more later. Um, so then I went from there to having Amber arrive. When actually this makes way more sense. She's been home, she's got changed, she's come down to use the stand-up paddleboard. Presumably she's been out in the water already and now she's putting a paddleboard away. All still the morning. This is all, you know, within the space of an hour or whatever. So it's got to be at least afternoon by the time Amber goes around to see Steve in the next scene. This uh, was also an early, early thing that we filmed. You'll notice that uh, Talia or Kyla now has blue hair. Uh, anything with the blue hair was filmed earlier in the production uh, because there was a little bit of a pause and Kyla went away and got a new style and I mean when you when you when when I am making these films that have so many locations and depend on getting so many different people together in the same place at the same time it's tough. I mean, this, I think there were, I would have to check because I've got records of these things. I think there's 26 filming days, not full days, but diff 26 different days spread over a long, long time. Um, but I, I do, I do like this, this scene between the two of them. And obviously I couldn't monitor this live. Uh, the, the two of them are sitting there with a Zoom audio recorder between them and the camera on the dashboard. And then I am outside of the car watching everything on the kind of Wi-Fi link monitor to my phone. This is very low tech. I mean, you know, a lot of people make these no budget films, but they're using like really good cameras. I'm using a Panasonic LX100 or a pair of Panasonic LX100s. Um, and then briefly a Canon M50 in the. Hmm. Possibly only the final therapy scene but it might be all of the therapy scenes. Those therapist office scenes are some of the last things that I filmed, and we filmed them all over the space of uh, consecutive weekends. It was the first, I think it was one Saturday and the next Saturday, or maybe it was Sundays, I, I don't know. Again, there's records, it doesn't matter. Um, that line, because I wanted to have sex all the time, and he didn't is the only mistake in this otherwise perfect scene. And Maddie had the he and I the wrong way around. And I really cared about it. So I not particularly skillfully chopped it up and just flipped around the I and he. And there is an awkward pause. It's kind of like, because I wanted to have sex all the time and he didn't. Um, But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's fine. I, I do think a lot of these things that I'm giving myself a pass for are making me sound a little bit like Ed Wood in the kind of like, yeah, it'll be all right. Um, and, I, and I don't like that I find myself going, oh, it's okay considering or it's good enough considering. I don't necessarily think that that is an excuse and I also don't really feel they're huge errors. 
I mean, for, for me, the test is, is the film fun to watch? Is it funny? Is it well acted? Is it well written? Is it passably shot? Is the sound good? And the answer to most of those questions, I think, is yes. I mean, look, we've got visible kit. Look in the back of that car. That is equipment. But who's to say that uh, Talia doesn't carry around photographic equipment? I mean, may maybe Talia is the killer. Who knows? Maybe in the club when we saw that long brown hair come down, that was that was Talia uh, wearing a wig underneath the mask as a kind of fake out or trying to frame somebody. I mean, Maddie's just great. Look at that. Like, come on, next. She's funny. I would have loved to be able to cut from this scene to the 5K, but meh, what are you gonna do? This does play a lot better this way. I haven't actually watched the entire film with this scene here, and clearly I'm not watching it now because I'm talking over the whole thing. But. Yeah, so we got the banging on the door, and you can probably also hear banging outside, which is uh, Niagara Falls fireworks. I'm close enough to Niagara Falls fireworks to get them most of the nights. There's another camera shadow. I love the energy between these two. There's there's things in the script that I've mentioned where I was like, oh, I'd imagined it a different way. And then there's things where I think they kind of are improved by the actors. And I, I love the kind of, I don't know if it's chemistry or like energy between these two, but I, I think and they've, they've really got three scenes together. There's a, there's a club and there's a cafe and then there's this scene. And I just, I like the energy between the two of them. And they're good friends in real life. As, I, as I've said, I got Alex in this film because Mark suggested her. So I... Yeah, I, I guess I met her and read some stuff with her and she absolutely loved this like because she read it and loved the script and really wanted to do it and she is the most dedicated person um you know always knew everything perfectly like super keen to be involved like when are we filming again when are we doing this when are we doing this and yeah she's great and i'm weirdly looking forward to watching the next thing she's done because the next movie she is doing is um with Brian Dudeman, uh, as he is known um, from the Buffalo Yup. He's making a movie with uh, several actresses that I know either from working on things or just, you know, I guess because everybody who makes anything here in Buffalo, we kind of know each other. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing that. I've got no idea what it's about, but it's just kind of fun to watch films made by people you know. Um, here's that guitar riff again. Such manipulation. This kind of like soft, sweet music when we know what's going to happen. I don't think there's a lot of crossover between this and What You Can't Promise. This is much more traditional in the way that it's filmed. But this scene is a long, continuous take of conversation, much like pretty much every scene in What You Can't Promise. These, these two are both fantastic in this. I mean, 
when you're editing on a laptop and you have a tiny screen, you kind of get a sense of what's going on. That's fine. But when you watch on a giant TV or if you watch it on a huge screen, as I've had the chance to do now twice, it really is fascinating to watch a scene that's filmed like this because you can kind of look between the two actors and you almost enjoy it like you would a play rather than being coerced into looking at one or the other. I mean, like, you know, you can listen to what the singer entirely focused on Amber's reaction. I mean, what Alex is doing here, like the subtlety, like you can tell that she is in it. And it's and it's the same thing with with Steve, with, with Mark. I mean, he's you can see the thoughts, the the character's thoughts behind what he's saying. And the kind of symbiotic relationship between who the actor is and who the character is and how they kind of meet in the middle. It is kind of nice to be the puppet master. And it's both good and bad that I'm not in this film because, you know, watching what you can't promise with an audience is a little bit uncomfortable when you're watching yourself on screen. But at the same time, I'm like this invisible energy. Like, I made this film. I am. My DNA is all over this film, but I'm not anywhere to be seen. She kind of reminds me of um, Mikey from Scream 5. As she kind of descends into darkness... I allowed Alex to do what she described as looking like herself. Like, she has, like, a little bit of a dark edge to her look. But I very much wanted to highlight the kind of innocent, you know, but wouldn't melt kind of sweetheart for the first half of the film. And, but she, she much more felt that, like, I'm going to murder everyone <laughs> uh, towards the second half of the film. Yes, that's just a te cheesy joke, and it's the whole purpose for the scene, and I don't even care. I, c I could have maybe done a little bit more here with the chopping in and out. You know, I could have done that on the stab. But at some point, you have to just let the edit go. It's frantic. It's a kind of homage, and it's not my first to psycho with the kind of, like, choppy, the music cuts, the knife cuts, the kind of confusing disorientation that goes along with cutting in, cutting him. She's murdering a, uh, I think it was a melon. Yeah, we, we got like a blood pack on a melon and let her go at it with a knife. And that little fade was just something funny found in the edit. I don't know why I don't hold the grave longer there, actually. Um, perhaps I ought to. Maybe I, I fade out for too long. Maybe the grave should be longer. I, I perhaps I've just accidentally jumped over it. It's it's. Less than half a second, but the transition from the end of that scene to the intro of the graveyard, and the graveyard just seems very, very short today. So, yeah, we've got Gino there, we've got Jay there, we've got Shonda, we've got Alex, we've got Sal. All of those people are involved in the Buffalo film community in one way or another. And like most people who know, yeah, most people who are in the kind of like Buffalo filmmaking clique will know all of those people. Um, Thank you. 
As I said, the longer version of that speech is incredible. I, I wrote a version and I said, feel free to just kind of go with it and extrapolate however you want. And Aaron absolutely killed it. And I need to share that somewhere. Uh, like partly I might even just make a trailer based on that. It was just brilliant. This kill didn't work the way I wanted it to. They, they had a kind of tumble in the car where she she like tried to you know she tries to stab him he wrestles the knife off her then she tries to get him with like choke him with her thighs it, it sort of it looked really awkward and so I didn't even bother editing it although now I'm talking about it, I'm thinking oh do I have to edit that so I've got some kind of bonus content for the physical release um, he looks at the knife you know, it's, it's a mistake, and that, I, the point of this commentary isn't for me to go, there's a cock up, there's a cock up, there's a cock up, there's a cock up, that is, you know, it, there's, there's things I can't see, and now I just feel like, okay, if you're bearing with me and listening, care enough to listen to this movie, you can hear the what's and all commentary, like, these are the mistakes. This is a real 5K. Those are the real shirts for the 5K. This is all sponsored by The Craft on uh, 3rd in Niagara Falls. Uh, those t-shirts did come out of the budget. I had to pay for those t-shirts. Um, but I went to the real event and I filmed at the real event. And neither of the people that Jill, Maddie, we were never anywhere near any 5k. I filmed at a few different 5ks and then I'm doing that thing where I don't film people's faces because I didn't have everybody sign off. That texting I wish that I'd noticed when I was filming because I would have dwelled on it longer than I do just there. Here he comes. A couple of times around Maddie's hair, we get this kind of green hue that almost looks like I've green screened her into a fake backdrop. It's just the grass reflecting. Um, but annoyingly, it looks like it's a composite shot. If you decide to take up 5K running in the US, be prepared to hear versions of this song a lot. I enjoyed that. Again, from the real race. Oh, uh, Hegan gets rejected again. Poor guy. I would have loved for this to be bloodier and bigger and like more of an intense flag. I had this flag for about a year before we filmed this because I knew that I wanted to do it at some point. There we go. And then here's Hope, who is also a filmmaker. Um, so yeah, just not noticing the body. I mean, why would you? You know, you're too busy with your messages or your Instagram or whatever to shut down. And now we no longer need a costume. The costume is out of the bag or back into the bag and into the trash. I can't remember what's actually on that business card, but I did not have a business card made up. Right, now the... The oven clocks of this movie, this oven clock read 12.06 because that's when we filmed it and I didn't cover it up. But what I did do is several passes at compositing a shot just so that I could kind of 
green screen the time and fade it out and yeah, this took, I don't, I don't know, probably something like 10 hours just to get rid of the clock on the oven. And it's a detail that pretty much nobody would even notice. And because I had kind of decided on a picture lock for this scene, I then had to just accept that that was 100% finished when maybe I would have liked to go back and look at it. I This kind of like implying that Talia fucked Steve feels a bit of a cheat. I, you know, while I'm pointing out mistakes, if you look at the back of the dress, there is a little tag sticking up, which bugs me every time, but I don't know how to do anything about that. Or, I, like, if I had, like, Disney CGI people, they'd be able to take that out for me, I'm sure, but I do not, so I don't. Again, you can tell from the kind of reverse, if Kyla's hair is blue, it was filmed earlier. The blonde came later. And I, you know, we, we had hats and then we had, you know, Kyla had offered to wear a, a blue streak under the hat kind of pretend that it was still blue and I just thought you know I'll just flip it I will just acknowledge it and then I'll do a throwaway line because it comes at an awkward moment in the film so Talia has witnessed Derek die and then in her grief goes and dyes her hair yeah okay you know, for all my bad mouth in this film and pointing out all the mistakes, I still, I absolutely love it. I have so much fun with this film. But I probably shouldn't do a commentary alone again. Because I never should have. And I only have my perspective to show. That's not to say I can't do another commentary that's just the actors. I feel like there would be a f fun conversation between these guys if I kind of step back and just let them talk about it. We're watching poor little Steve lay down on the floor. I got really good, really committed actors for all of this. And it's it's hard to kind of see that when you're stressing out, thinking, oh shit, I've got to get this filmed, or I've got to get this done, or what's next, or is this ever going to come together? But, I, yeah, this is great. This is like kind of tonally perfect. It's, I like this film. I, I kind of feel like I've got my little Amber speech going on, and I was like, People like me, filmmakers, who throw everything we have, all of our time and our energy into making a movie that's just going to get rejected after months of paying and waiting for a film festival. This has entered into a bunch of like LGBTQ festival thing. I mean... I have got lots of identifying actors in the cast. I've got three people. The plot is very much that. That noise caused me problems. The, the banging the pot. It was initially silent. Then I added a little something. Then I added a something and a crush, crunch sound. I don't even know what I what I stayed on. But the the kind of crack sound is too much, or it was too loud because it. It sounded like a breaking bone, and the reason for that is because it's the exact sounds that I used in the lodger. So the lodger is referenced in this, and by attractive is referenced in this. Um, that may be it. You know, I was hoping to, you know, have 
Oh, the what you can't promise uh, DVD at the start. Is there any Basil Bond? I don't think so, other than the tone. This suit also came into the budget as Brandon did not have a suit. So I I got this. I think it looks great on him. <laughs> He's so awkward. I love him. He's brilliant. I, 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 I'm really excited to see, to watch this film with Brandon and see what reaction it gets from him because... He is wonderful. Just saw a little glitch there for the first time in the image. Um, that again, that's only the film freeway version. It will be cleared up for when this goes anywhere. Joe is great here. Very quiet, very underplayed. Absolutely perfect. Little out of focus, but it's fine. It has that kind of like old movie feel. Play some music. Nice little sound bridge there back to the cafe. Here's Jana again, or Sammy. Such little perky music. The little girl in the background is her daughter, and she's reading a really dense text in German. Not that you can see because it's out of focus, but it was kind of a fun moment on the day. <laughs> Even though it's not in focus, I love that kind of little tracking, oh uh, well, back to my book. Wings, you cannot make a movie in Buffalo or in Western New York without a plate of wings. I think that's that's a rule. That might be in the kind of uh, the New York Film Commission, the Western New York Film Playbook is you must have some wings. Job that it, it people are very proud of their um, cuisine here, uh, which. You know, to an outsider, you might think, well, it's it's just it's just chicken with uh, spicy sauce on it. But no, that is apparently a uh, huge culinary discovery. I struggled a little bit with whether or not to capitalize God on the subtitles. And I don't even know if I've been consistent because it does read a little bit differently. I mean, there's reasons to do it with and without, but anything in this film, I did at some stage overthink and care about. Um, again, this could be a meteor death. I'm, I'm just not very good at killing. Or a meteor red there. I don't know. There's, there's things I could change. But I don't want to keep going back and saying, oh, I've got to edit this, got to edit this, got to edit this. Because this film is done. It's been screened publicly twice and it's been rejected from God knows how many festivals. Two. One. I took out the one, two, three there. And then I put it back. 
because it's a demo. So the the counting is is just for timing. It is for Kim who's singing. Um, sorry, Alex, I'm out on you. Alex is the only person who doesn't do her own singing in this film. Um, but Kim counted for the demo, but I took it out and I I, I didn't like the sound, so I instead used the counting as part of the edit, as you've just seen. And then we're back to the final song of the movie. This is me singing or rapping uh, slash begging. If you pay attention to the lyrics, uh, it's basically, hey, I made this film for nothing, so, you know, go easy on me. We're singing is in public, so make it a hit. Mm. I i don't have a rap career, um, nor will I ever have. But I'm singing in the credits because it was the, you know, I'm available. I am the, I'm the easiest person to get on board when it comes to doing these things. Yeah, and I enjoy it. Oh, at the funeral, I didn't mention Rich uh, Tippett, who was just credited, but I, I had already mentioned him. Um, I think I've credited everyone there, except uh, Mike MJ Dixon, who is a much more established filmmaker than I am, but he's also an old friend. We went to university together, and he is way better at all that graphic stuff than I am. So he made the poster. And... But here are all my songs. And I, I, I wrote him a song. I wrote a Slaper Fool song back. So that's kind of where we're at, you know? Play to your strengths. I'm not saying songwriting's my strength, but I, I you know, I, I enjoy it. It's passable, it's fun. We actually got some money. Thanks for listening, everyone. Now this is Taylor Martin, who has only been making films for a couple of years, but has already had won tons of awards like her stuff gets accepted in festivals and wins the festivals and she's been out to Portugal with her work and now she's you know she was hired to be a director on one feature film and now she's directing her second feature film um, so I've been totally eclipsed by someone who has only just started and I am yeah she's great like she works hard but yeah I'm jealous you know thanks for listening We'll see.